I think we're sort of doing the equivalent of ringing the bells now to get this next session going. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, we've got a, a very interesting um, final session where we're going to look at the implications and where to from here type questions. We've got an excellent panel here, all coming from a different perspective, business, academia, the Council for the Ageing and as well as Treasury, so it's a, it's a great collection. We'll start off with um, Craig Dunn. Craig is the former CEO of AMP Group, obviously a major player in superannuation and wealth management in this country, and more recently was involved with a financial systems inquiry. Um, and so Craig uh, is well um, prepared, I think, to, to offer his thoughts on this issue. Craig. Thanks very much, Mark, and uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me along today. So the intergenerational report obviously makes a number of important conclusions and talks a lot about uh, things like improving uh, participation rates and the productivity in the economy to, uh, to address some of the challenges we face over the long term. Importantly, it also notes uh, that uh, improving the way our system converts superannuation bal balances into retirement incomes is also something that warrants uh, due consideration. And that's really the lens that I'd like to look at this morning in terms of how that improvement can be made and some of the challenges we face in doing that. I, I think most uh, observers of our superannuation system in Australia would say it's a pretty sophisticated system, it's a well-developed system in the accumulation phase, and um, it's got some challenges and areas where it can improve, but again, in the accumulation phase, most independent commentators would say it's pretty well placed internationally uh, against other systems around the world. I think, though, those same independent commentators would say in the deaccumulation phase or the retirement income phase, as people are moving into retirement and are drawing down on their incomes, that the system is not as well developed and has a number of uh, significant challenges that need to be addressed. And one of those is the issue of longevity risk and how we might deal with that more effectively. And I'd like to focus my comments particularly on that risk and do so in part through the lens of the, some of the conclusions or recommendations um, from the financial system inquiry. In a sense, longevity risk, uh, like any other commercial risk or personal risk, can benefit from an effective insurance system, which leads to more efficient outcomes for both individuals and for the economy more broadly. And as I said, longevity risk uh, is, no, is no different. And, and when you think about longevity risk, um, there's some common ways that economies around the world, particularly more developed economies, tend to address the risk. Um, a key part of most economies is uh, taxpayer support through an age pension, which provides a base level of support, particularly for those people who haven't been able to provide uh, for themselves in, in retirement. Secondly, you have uh, a system of, uh, if you like, self-funded or self-insurance is a way to think about our superannuation system, where through compulsory contributions and also some attractive tax concessions, people are encouraged and compelled to self-fund or self-insure for their retirement and their longevity risk. And then thirdly, you have, um, if you like, opportunities uh, to insure and where um, people uh, are encouraged to insure for certain risks. And I think it's interesting to compare this area of sort of risk to other areas in our system. So if you take uh, our health system at a very high level, it too has a, uni a universal healthcare system, a component to it, where all Australians have a base level of cover. It also then has a form of insurance above that. And in some of the insurance markets, like health insurance, there are incentives or, or penalties to encourage um, the private insurance system. And indeed, in other forms of insurance, like third-party motor vehicle insurance, people are compelled. If you want to be able to drive a motor vehicle and have it registered, insurance becomes compulsory. Um, so in our retirement income system, there's a mix of ways of dealing with longevity risk, as there are with other risks in our system like health insurance. It's fair to say, though, that in longevity risk, we really haven't been able to generate a private market or a market solution to ensuring longevity risk. And indeed, if you look at other markets around the world, we're not alone. Um, in fact, in, more, in the more wholesale market or reinsurance market, like longevity bonds or longevity swaps and those sorts of things, the market is very limited internationally and virtually doesn't exist outside the UK, although that's starting to change. But it's a very um, embryonic market 
and so this is not an issue that's just common to Australia. What's different about Australia, though, is as everyone would know in the room, we have very much a defined contribution scheme in our country. Many other countries uh, have much more of systems that rely more on defined benefits. And of course, in both systems, longevity risk prevails. The difference in a defined contribution scheme is the, the longevity risk, if you like, outside the, the provision of the, the government pension is a risk that the individual has to bear. In a defined benefit scheme, it might be employers or others that are, are bearing that risk. So in Australia, like other markets, we haven't been able to develop a private solution, if you like, to longevity risk protection. And for our market, you might argue it's even more important for the individual because the risk is ultimately borne by the individual or the taxpayer if they rely on the age pension. So I just thought I'd make some quick observations on why I think there has, if you like, been a market failure in this part of our market. Firstly, insurance markets don't work very well where it's very difficult to price the risk. And the challenge, and this was noted in the, in the CEPA submission to uh, the Financial System Inquiry, and I should thank CEPA and John Piggott and others and Mark for the quality of their submissions with the inquiry found very valuable, particularly in this area, makes the point that it's very difficult to forecast future mortality and therefore it's very difficult to price for that risk. In fact, given the advances in medical technology, which was covered in the earlier session, um, some people would argue it's almost a one-way bet. Now, of course, there are distribution uh, outcomes, different people living longer ages, and again, that was covered in the previous session, but it's very hard to price for the risk. Secondly, at certain age cohorts, the risk is almost certain to occur. So if you're looking for longevity prote protection at the risk of age 80, uh, 65, rather, a large proportion of the population is going to live to 65, so insurance will never be uh, economic. At older ages, where the average might be 85 or whatever, the distribution curve applies though, and it's more able to provide um, a form of longevity insurance. The third area which I think um, is important in Australia, and it's also common in some other markets, is that there are cultural issues. For a longevity risk pool, like any risk pool to be effective, you have to have the concept that people paying premiums or pe people bearing the cost of that risk mitigation or that insurance, not everyone can claim. And so in some other countries, for example, uh, unbundled life insurance is, is very difficult to sell because culturally in those countries, um, the concept of paying for something, even though you're actually paying for certainty, the paying for something and, and the feeling of not getting any benefit doesn't resonate and therefore people struggle to take up that particular product. And Mark will be familiar with that given his previous work experience. If you think about our system in longevity risk and bequests, there's a, a cultural uh, expectation, I think, in our country that if you die at a younger age, then your right to future income or your right to the assets that you've accumulated up to that point in your life should pass to your family. And I think that's quite a, a strong cultural dynamic in our community. Now, it's very difficult for a longevity risk pool to work when people who die at a younger age, their accumulated benefits, if you like, can't pass to other people in the pool who are going to live to a longer age. That's how insurance works. So this issue of bequests is a really important issue, I think, for the community and for one that we should um, or need to discuss. And I, I want to come back to that um, in a moment. So I think if you step back from that, that brief overview, I think in the area of, of longevity risk there, and the way that we're dealing with that as a community, remember we've got the age pension, we've got self-funding, if you like, through the superannuation system, and then we've got ideally a longevity risk market which largely doesn't exist today. So I think there are sort of two public policy issues that leap out of that that could flow on from um, the intergenerational report. The first one is when you think of those three forms of longevity risk protection, looking at it at a very high level, is how should they work together and what is the most efficient bundle for them to be effective? And I think the discussion that it looks like the community is about to have in terms of how the age pension or the rights to the age pension interact with people that are perhaps more prepared for retirement and have been able to accumulate higher assets or rights to future income streams and how there might be improved or more efficient trade-offs is a healthy discussion for the community to have. 
The other significant public policy issue, though, of course, is can we develop a private sector market in longevity risk protection? Is it possible for us to encourage that market to exist? And one of the important uh, calculations or pieces of evidence that's presented in the financial system inquiry is a very significant improvement in retirement income outcomes if longevity risk pools were effective and if we can deal with that bequest issue. That doesn't mean when someone dies early all their assets should go into the accumulated pool, but perhaps some proportion should. And again, there's some maths in the uh, financial system inquiry that shows there's a dramatic improvement in retirement incomes if we can get longevity risk pooling to work. So it's, you know, Hazel might comment on this later, it, it's, it's a very important issue to the retirement incomes debate that gets very little coverage. Perhaps because it's complex, perhaps because there are cultural issues that we you know, are going to be challenged to address, but it needs that debate. I think if you look back on our history, and if you look back where we've got to from now, it's hard to say that the market will find a solution, because frankly it hasn't. And as I mentioned earlier, and I'll finish up now, there are other schemes of insurance in the country where there is some sort of government intervention, if you like, to make that insurance more effective. And the simple conclusion in the financial system inquiry is we should do that by mandating that APRA regulated funds need to provide, through a form of soft default, um, a retirement income stream option for their members um, that's available to them. Final point, I think it's very hard to have a good debate in this area and a good discussion that I think the community needs to have, as I've mentioned before, if we can't agree on what the primary objective of our superannuation system is. It's sort of almost self-evident that we need to have a community agreement on what we're trying to achieve with our retirement system. The financial system inquiry put forward one proposal, that it's about retirement incomes that then substitute or supplement the age pension. But it's very hard to have an informed discussion and agree to a final conclusion if as a community we haven't agreed on our overall objective for our superannuation system. Thanks, Mark. <coughs> Thank, thanks, Craig. That was um, great, great insight. Um, our next speaker, we'll, we'll come to questions at the end as we did with the first session. The next speaker is uh, Professor Hazel Bateman. She's um, uh, head of School of Actuarial Studies at uh, UNSW and also Associate uh, Investigator with CPAR. Thanks, Hazel. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Mark, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. Um, so the things that I'm going to talk about are framed on and two things that I took out from the intergenerational report. One of these is it's obvious that there's an increase in cost to the Commonwealth Government of age-related expenses to do with pensions, health and aged care. And the second thing that I took away is um, the difficulty we have in projecting life expectancy. So going between the first and the fourth report, we've seen increases in projected life expectancy. Um, so if the experts don't, can't project it, how can individuals plan for their retirement when they're also you know, faced with trying to work out how long they're going to live? Um, I'd also like to say that you know, looking forward, starting with the intergenerational report today and looking forward to the next 40 years, we shouldn't be complacent with current policy and assume that what we have today is the right policy settings. Um, and we only have to look at the reaction to you know, increased government expenditure and budget deficits and we see proposals to change indexation in the age pension. Now, that debate really you know, it shouldn't happen on its own. It should be part of a coordinated debate about superannuation, about the relationship between superannuation and the age pension with means tests and tapers. Um, and I think there's a real concern that a starting point becomes the intergenerational report and these piecemeal policies are made. Now, looking at my first point, um, that the cost to government of these age-related expenditures is going to increase over time, the obvious implication of that is that there's going to be an increased role for the private sector and for individuals to undertake those expenditures. Relating um, to Craig's points, this means that individuals are going to have to take a greater burden of financing longevity. In, if the age pension is going to be cut, if less people get the age pension, individuals are going to have to make up that gap themselves. And at the moment, we don't really have the right product mix. You know, once you get to retirement, you can choose to take a lump sum, take an account-based pension. Very few people take life annuities. We really don't have the products there in the private market to help people 
uh, make up the gap between the, sort of the living standard and longevity and what the government's going to be able to provide. And I, I think we need to have a very good look at, at policies that um, prohibit and prevent innovation in these markets. You know, it would be really nice to have some longevity products. It would be really nice to have some sort of products that help people use the, the ownership of their house to fund their retirement. Uh, we haven't talked much about aged care today, but it's probably unlikely that the government in 40 years' time is going to support people the way they do in aged care. So maybe we need to think about cleverer policy prescriptions for aged care funding, you know, using our house to fund aged care, but having an official markets to allow us to do that. Um, and this all raises the question of the, uh, the issue of um, the increasing responsibility that individuals are going to have to make these decisions. You know, once, before we had superannuation, many people would get the aged pension, perhaps get a defined benefit pension, perhaps there'd be government support for aged care. But increasingly, over the next 40 years, individuals are going to have to make more of those decisions themselves. And again, I don't think we have the policy position right today. You know, even in superannuation today, when we're asking people to make decisions as they enter retirement, you know, how do we help people? We provide superannuation funds, provide information. We have financial advisors. You know, it's, it's not clear that we're helping people appropriately today. Never mind over the next 40 years when people are probably going to have to make more individual decisions and receive less government support. Now, so I think we need to think very carefully about policy design where we have maybe well-designed default options, as suggested in the financial system inquiry. We have to think about educating people and educating people about the risks they might face, about longevity risk in particular. Now, I think people have to understand that they're going to live a hell of a long time, uh, much longer than they probably think they are. And perhaps that'll help people plan. Perhaps that'll help people think that maybe I do have to work a bit longer if I'm going to live you know, a long time. Um, a personal anecdote on that, um, I, dis I got on a website and I filled out the questionnaire in longevity.com, which if anyone's familiar with that, they ask you a whole range of questions about, about your health and your parents' health and your, whether you drink and smoke and all those sorts of things. You know, and I was probably a bit optimistic. You know, I said I only had three glasses of wine a week rather than eight glasses of wine a week or whatever. Um, but it told me I was going to live till I was 98. Now, you know, <laughs> you know, I think I know a fair bit about longevity risk and I've worked in superannuation for 20 odd years. But when I, when I sort of thought, I'm going to live till I'm 98, I'm not going to be retiring at 60 or 65. You know, I've got to fund a retirement up to 98. And you know, I think you know, if, if individuals making decisions are actually are aware of those, you know, those sorts of phenomena, maybe people will think differently about retiring at 55 and taking transition to retirement pensions and travelling around the world in their 60s. You know, if there was a bit more longevity literacy and people actually understood these things, then maybe individuals are going to be making different decisions. But I, I guess my key thing here is that even today, we're not really helping people enough with these decisions they have to make. Perhaps we're not giving people the right information. People are not aware of the risks. Um, there's no doubt that people are going to have to rely on financial advice, and it's certainly not clear that we've got the financial advice part of the story correct. Um, so you know, I, I think there's a real concern here that it's obvious with the intergenerational report that public expenditure is going to fall. Individuals are going to be far more responsible for things and we really need to prepare those individuals you know, for that. Um, and I guess a, a final thing that I'd like to... Well, two, more fine, two more things I'd like to say. One of the things that we have to be aware of too is that even though people are going to be having healthier, longer lives they are going to fall into cognitive decline and dementia later in life. Um, and the figures show that in 40 years' time, there's going to be twice as many older people um, and a, a greater proportion of people over 85 and a greater proportion of people over 100. So you know, maybe we need to think about innovative ways of caring for those people. This is going to be expensive, another stress on government budget. And a final thing I'd like to say as an academic, um, we, we research a lot of these things, so we look at, at different sorts of products and, and ways of um, managing longevity risk. 
We look at different ways of helping people make complex decisions. We look at um, how we can reduce dementia and, and help people as, make decisions as they're growing old. But what we really need is more data. And the sort of data we need is, is individual data. There's lots of aggregate data around, but we really need individual data. And one of the sort of, I think, the great tragedies is many of our brightest students uh, working in CPAR, for example, <coughs> do interesting work but are using uh, HRS data from the US. So it would be really terrific if we had an Australian database and we could actually do this research for Australian conditions. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Hazel. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Ian Yates. Ian Yates is the Chief Executive of the Council on the Ageing for Australia and he's been involved with that organisation for, for many, many, many years and um, we'll come with another perspective. Thank you for that, uh, and thanks to CPAR for the invitation and for thinking that uh, it might be good to have uh, involved in one of the panels someone who doesn't come from an academic or government policy perspective, but kind of from the end uh, recipients of the outcomes um, of, the, of those things. CODA, of course, is the peak body for older Australians. Through the Federation of CODAs, there are more than 1,100 member organisations that reach over half a million older Australians as well as about 40,000 people who belong directly to us. What I want to do is make a series of observations, really, that are not necessarily a theme, although I will kind of weave one into it, um, about what people have said and about the IGR itself, uh, in the hope that that might provoke some discussion. Um, I, I note the, the limitations of the IGR as described by some of the speakers. In fact, someone was uh, cheeky enough during morning tea to suggest that as described, which is essentially about Commonwealth expenditures that really ought to be written by finance rather than by Treasury, uh, because projecting uh, current expenditures uh, against current po or up across current policy settings is really what finance does and Treasury is trying to do with the bigger picture. Of course, the narrative that government is putting out there around the IGR at the moment, advertising campaigns and other things, is much more about those bigger macro questions of the future of the country, and that is appropriate. And at least the IGR takes us, or tries to take us, outside of the three-year electoral cycle to think about policy over the longer term, which is a very rare thing in politics. In fact, anything longer than a week, uh, of course, is very... In fact, at the moment, it would appear, in terms of retirement incomes policies, daily basis um, is the time frame for public debate. Um, I think there is a very significant issue about how we get a better public debate and how we get greater awareness about all of these issues. Uh, that needs to be addressed politically and also by our media um, in terms of uh, the way that they tackle these issues. Uh, one of the things that we have been proposing in that context and um, linking to what Hazel said, of course, is a retirement incomes review that looks at superannuation, pensions, the taxation regime in that whole space and, uh, and leading up to it. Uh, dealing with uh, um, uh, uh, mature age workforce issues and dealing with, the, uh, more laterally, we've started to think about that, dealing with financing of aged care. Um, that segues into one of the big gaps because of the nature of the IGR from my constituency's perspective. It doesn't talk about tax expenditures and it especially doesn't talk about the tax concessional treatment of superannuation and uh, retirees in their super. Uh, one of the, uh, you might say, one of the most mis no, strangest policy decisions made by the uh, former coalition government, which was to take all superannuation pension people out of the tax system. Um, Peter Whiteford raised distributional issues and sustainability, and you can't talk about the pension in those contexts without talking about super. You just cannot. You've got to talk about them together. Um, the other, another observation is that we still fundamentally have two ways of talking about the ageing population or two lenses to see it through. One is the traditional burden cost -ish approach, the tsunami of sunk cost, uh, old people running us over uh, substantially uh, affecting every aspect of our lives. The other is to take a more uh, op opportunity focused, a more productivity lens on it. I don't think we know very well how to do that. I could talk to you for the next hour about how we might do that, but we won't. 
But we need uh, to get much more focused. Uh, I think David Cullen was quite right to raise the point of return on investment. If you're investing m money into older people in a health system, does that actually generate a return? Uh, and what does that mean? I fully agree with Craig about risk. I think there are two areas of risk that we have to look at to get a more sustainable uh, super policy. One is longevity risk and sharing of that, and the other is actually investment risk, because I think it's very <coughs> weird that 90% of financial advisors tell people in retirement and approaching retirement to go into safe, low return investments uh, instead of big ones, but then you, instead of higher, higher ones, but uh, then you've got uh, an investment risk. So if you talk about that as well. Um, Sean raised the question or proposed that there are actually four stages of retirement. I don't know if there are four, but I think it's very important that we don't regard all older people as the same beast. That is a very common policy mistake that we make, that we regard them as all. Once you're over 65, as we know, you're past it on the slippery slope on the way out, uh, get your feet up, smell the roses, and all those other things that we talk about. Uh, of course, that's rubbish. Uh, as we know, about a third of people between 65 and 70 are still in the workforce and quite a lot more would like to be. Um, everybody, as the Treasurer acknowledged, pays tax, whether or not they pay their fair share, but everyone's a taxpayer. They, there are all sorts of contributions. But what that does raise is the question which Hazel's also raised for the first time today, and that is what the IGR says about aged care. Now, aged care has been through a reform process which has introduced a significant amount more user pays. That's going to cause, that is causing some controversy as it rolls out. But what the IGR tells us, on the one hand, is that if the pension is left unchecked, rampantly going ahead on current policy settings, it goes from 2.9 to 3.6% of GDP, an extra 0.7% of GDP. That's a lot, but it's not as much as it would have been if the super system wasn't there turning lots of full pensioners into part pensioners. But if you look at aged care, it's only a little old 0.8% of GDP, but where is it at the end? It's 1.7% of GDP. It actually is going to be cost more of GDP extra than the pensions are going to cost extra. So I predict that we're going to have a sub substantial focus on how you finance aged care as a, as a major public policy issue. So the question we were asked then was, well, where do we go with all this? I just want to refer then to aged care where we've got now. We set about in 2009 achieving aged care reform. We wanted better outcomes for consumers and we wanted a more sustainable system. We achieved that. We achieved a number of things. We achieved aged care reform under an ALP government, which has never been traditionally very interested in that kind of reform. We, re we, we had a reform that delivers better outcomes for consumers, which I won't enumerate now, at a lower cost to government than would have been the case, and we achieved bipartisan policy. How did we did that? We brought all the stakeholders together. We hammered out with stakeholders uh, what, where people agreed and disagreed. We worked out what was a reasonable compromise. We used an inquiry process to help in that, uh, and we achieved those outcomes. I think it's really, really important in this space that we do the same. Immediately, what we need to do is do it in the retirement income space, which already, as I've indicated, covers a lot more than just a narrow focus, but a much broader focus. But that needs to be part of a bigger focus, a whole of government focus on how you attack, approach the issue of an ageing population through a productivity lens, through an investment, a return on investment lens, and to get up an engagement of stakeholders in a, in a formal process that will get a larger degree of consensus than anybody thinks is possible. I've sat through two round tables in the last couple of weeks, one by the Assistant Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, one by Chris Bowen, the Shadow Treasurer, uh, both of them with a significant amount of retirement income people, industry stakeholders in the room. They all observed that there was just huge amount more consensus about where we needed to go than was possible even five years ago. Um, the time is ripe now for us to move on this. So where should we go? That's where we should go. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much, Ian. Our, our next and final speaker is John Fraser, who's recently appointed Secretary of Treasury, prior to which he was Chairman and CEO of UBS Global Asset Management in London. So he's coming with two lenses to, to this, this, uh, this issue. John? Okay, thanks very much. I'm very conscious of the time, so... I'll 
show severely truncate my comments. Um, very interesting in a number of the comments and uh, much of which I'd agree with. Um, I come to the IGA, IGR as being one of those who, uh, in the Audit Commission in 70, uh, sorry, 96, uh, we brought forward the Charter of Budget Honesty and the IGR, of course, has flowed from that. So it's rather nice to see it getting so much attention. But that said, I have been a little bit surprised, only having been back 10 weeks or so, um, that these issues haven't been debated more because they're so fundamental and they're not particularly pro profound in terms of their being novel. They are profound issues which are associated with the ageing of the population, which is besetting virtually every major country in the world, probably with the exception of India and a couple of other smaller ones. Uh, the IGR, to me, is a tool, but one of many tools, for framing important public policy questions. We need to tackle for a number of reasons, including fiscal sustainability and the direction, and this is the more important one, the direction we want to take as a society. It's not a predictor of where we're going to be in 40 years. It's an indicator of where we would be in the absence or could be in the absence of addressing key issues now and in the future. Uh, past IGRs have highlighted the key role demographic change has made in shaping our society, uh, our in, uh, influencing our economic uh, capacity, and also the uh, effects of that demographic change on government services. They've also told the story of key external drivers that shape our economy. They haven't covered everything, as Ian indicated. There's a number of areas that are not covered. And, um, but, you know, it's one of many documents which helps to frame the debate. Um, going forward, for instance, technology and international economic integration are making all our factors of production more mobile. I'm an example of it. Uh, driving ever higher levels of efficiency. I'm not sure I'm an example of that, only the history will judge, and market competitiveness. For my part, one of the important considerations is the impact of the demographic, demographic trends that uh, on our tax system. Uh, we've got the tax uh, paper out, and hopefully that will uh, encourage a major debate on the many, many options in that area. Um, we must make some fundamental choices as a society about the level of tax, but we also have to make recognise that there are very real limits to relying on ever higher tax burdens, whether on individuals, corporations, or through indirect taxes on households, once the effects on investment, productivity and participation are considered. If we value an internationally competitive economy, then we need a modern tax system that enhances productivity, meets our revenue needs, minimises economic distortions and, crucially, promotes economic growth. Uh, we can't, in my view, uh, continue to run budget deficits without uh, very major impacts on public debt and diverting an ever-increasing share of public resources to servicing that debt that really should be diverted for doing better things in society. Um, Although seen by some as uh, using overly simplistic assumptions, the report helps, or the IGR helps to illustrate how these tax and debt constraints are binding, they are real. They bring real focus back to the sustainability of spending. Uh, I'd just like to indicate that uh, we work uh, very closely with fi finance, but I would have said that uh, uh, the direction of spending over the next 40 years would be a big enough issue even for Treasury to get involved in, uh, Ian. Um, but importantly, the modelling approach in the IGR holds policy as a constant. It's not a forecast. It's taking what we're doing now, holding it as a constant. It's our policies as they are now, what would happen over the next 40 years. The margin for error, considerable. Uh, nobody's going to be stupid enough to say that uh, we're going to put uh, numbers down to the last decimal place. The real potential of the IGR is in the contribution they can make to the case for policy change. If we can agree, and a lot of people don't, but if we can collectively agree that each generation should broadly pay its own way, then we must focus on two sets of issues. The first is how to continue to grow the economy and harness new opportunities in light of demographic trends and external influences. That is how to harness opportunities for productivity and participation amid an ageing population. 
And the second is to think more carefully as a society about our priorities for publicly funded services and the best models for their delivery. Or to put it another way, clarify society's expectations of government intervention and the safety net. I think that's absolutely crucial. Having lived in the United Kingdom for the past 13 years, there was a very real debate led by Ian Duncan Smith and a number of uh, the academic uh, think tanks and also the universities about expectation shaping. We've got to perhaps be a little bit more realistic. Uh, I'm going to leave out a few comments, but I will say about productivity. We've just had the Harper report, and Ian Harper, who's a fine fellow, uh, had the misfortune to follow uh, Fred Hilmer's report in the 90s, and of course that had a massive change, the policy responses to the Hilmer report, and that was a big factor in our growth during the 90s, and indeed after the 90s. Ian's recommendations are still very, very important. Uh, they don't have the headline-grabbing stuff that Fred Hilmer did, but uh, we have a meeting tomorrow uh, with the state treasurers. Joe Hockey will be chairing, and a key part of that, a key part of that will be trying to have the Commonwealth join with the states in recognising the role that structural reform can play in promoting growth and through that uh, uh, benefits for the whole economy. The second set of issues, uh, which I mentioned, goes to the design of our social compact and the fiscal consequences of that compact. It begins with the appropriate design of our safety net, which must, which must in a compassionate society, protect and serve the most vulnerable and ask us always, can we do better? There is a fiscal imperative to grapple with the efficacy of all government interventions. In this, uh, it's hard not to speak about so-called middle-class welfare and the set of difficult questions around retirement incomes and the array of concessions and incentives around the age pension, superannuation and housing. Having said that, these are not easy issues. I was there, as were many, when uh, there were the major reforms in the late 80s and the early 90s. A lot of the planning we did at that time hasn't proved to be correct. A lot of it has been has proved to be correct, but there were unintended or not forecast outcomes. And uh, I do think when we approach these issues, I think Hazel mentioned we need to do it in a very holistic way. Uh, we're, we're not smart enough in Treasury, and I think we're pretty smart, but we're not smart enough in Treasury to model third and fourth and fifth or to the end number uh, rounds of reactions to policy measures. We need to do it very carefully, and I think the time has come uh, 25 years or so after those big reforms to perhaps have a more fundamental think about uh, the interaction between superannuation, tax and uh, the whole welfare system. Um, and we also have to look um, about is there scope to shift sensibly away from taxpayer funded models to more consumer centric models, again with appropriate safety nets. These are always difficult issues for debate and for the politicians, but uh, you know, one of the key messages of the IGR is another reminder that these issues are not going to go away, and each year we delay addressing them will be, make them, I suspect, harder for those who have to address them down the track. Um, so uh, I'll be quick because i uh, leave room for questions, but uh, uh, I'd like to conclude my remarks by addressing the issue of con community engage engagement. Uh, not a big fan of the word conversation. I'd call it discussion, debate, what do you want to call. Uh, I think it was alluded to earlier by other speakers. It's sad to see the electoral cycle and other matters, meaning the debate here seems to be very short-lived. Uh, in some cases, I think it's a matter of hours. Sky News or the ABC, this perpetual 24-hour news cycle seems to result in things being put over the fence uh, within a few hours. That is sad. And I think the more there is a serious debate, uh, conferences like this play a big part of it, and uh, the better we're going to be for it. But it's going to be difficult, and the electoral cycle and the electoral situation will always be a major factor in this country, as it is in every other country, in addressing serious issues. But it does mean we just have to try harder and make sure that our arguments are well thought out and the, the result of very wide uh, discussion amongst all groups interested and otherwise. Thanks.
Thanks, John. Um, I think now we've got a few moments for some questions. So if anyone's got any questions or, you know, observations, uh, keep them brief so we can try and you know, be as effective as possible. Thank you, everyone. My name is Noelle from uh, Crawford School, ANU. Um, I personally come from Asia, from Hong Kong. I just want to bring the perspective to understand in order to address the um, aging population issues, how likely uh, we'll be able to address the issues from an intergeneration perspective. Uh, the reason I raise it is um, from an Asian perspective, we have a very strong obligations for financial contribution to our retired parents. So every one of our children actually will look after our parents by contributing financially because we don't have a very solid uh, pension structure. So in that re uh, respect, my, my mom is not living very well or wealthy, but is not living in absolute poverty. Now I just wonder, um, is it in the Australian cultural perspective, it is not really workable to have this intergeneral perspective of um, looking after the retired uh, parents, mm -hmm. and 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 secondly, uh, also like in the taxation structure, actually we can claim for tax deduction if we have a dependent retired parents. So uh, because we I, I noticed in, in the Australian taxation system, it doesn't count if you have a retired uh, depend uh, dependents uh, in your um, uh, in your uh, family. Um, when you need to look after them. Secondly, okay. I just wonder, is there, um, when you say that the uh, private market for uh, superannuation um, retired income is very limited in Australia, I just wonder what is the major obstacle in Australia to have this private market to develop? Okay. Thank because, you. Because, yeah. There's, because three, I, there's three I, questions there. We'll just yeah, take, because I'll just go on. Yes, so three questions. The first one I'll ask Ian to comment on. The, the second one, re-tax dependencies and old age. Get, um, Maybe unfair, but John to comment on, and the last one maybe Craig can um, comment on. Thank you. But, but yeah, <coughs> um, I, I think you've you've asked a good question, but my experience across with colleagues and friends across the whole of the Asian context, from you know, India and Southeast Asia and so on, is that indeed those traditional kind of um, arrangements are, are changing ignore, enormously. Yeah. Uh, and you are beginning to see uh, both large state pressures, pressures on the state to make provision for aged care and you're seeing the development of aged care systems that weren't there before. Um, I don't think they become applicable, but I, I would make the observation, of course, that the children are, do pay uh, for things through something called the tax system. Um, and, but there is a general point which I, which I don't have a disagreement with uh, with other panellists here, which is we need a thorough discussion about which things are more appropriately uh, in the hands of government and which we can free up uh, uh, the individual and the consumer to have more control over as well. Do you want to comment at all, or do you just pass on that one? Oh, no, look, I, it, it's not just Asia. I mean, there's a very strong um, uh, cultural uh, trend in Italy, and certainly in Greece, and some would argue in some parts of Germany, where uh, the children do take a, a great interest in their parents' health. I'm, uh, I'm personally trying to encourage it in my family. <laughs> uh, by clever crafting of my will. But uh, the... Uh, <laughs> Uh, look, I, I'm not an expert on it, but there are carers' allowances. But look, it, it's an important part of society. I think it's, it's a, for those who are looking after aged parents, and I saw it with my mother looking after my late, or my late mother looking after my late grandmother, I know the burden it can be, and it's a massive one. So you're not going to solve it with carers' allowances and things like that. But I, I would hope, and maybe it's a vain hope, that more generally uh, society will look on this as a very noble noble calling. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, look, I think I, I covered that um, in my, my comments, but I, I think there, there are some potential solutions. I think that, that first issue of it very difficult to price for risk, um, there are things called group self annuitisation schemes where there are effectively, I think, see, a Mercer representative in the audience, Mercer have just brought out a, a new product, I think, where, where effectively it's almost like a 
it's not a mutual, but it's almost it's a, everyone's pooling that risk and sharing in the benefits of it, rather than necessarily a, a company providing a capital guarantee. And there's some significant efficiencies in that. I think the other interesting thing, and again, I, I heard this via uh, in another conference that might have been Mercer's who made the point. When you look at DB schemes, where one way you address the, uh, the efficiency of a defined benefit scheme is if people do die earlier, a part of their uh, accrued benefits pass to the people that live longer. So when you're looking at a um, defined benefit or a defined income scheme, it seems that people are more accepting of that reality than in a defined contribution scheme. So maybe the way we communicate, or the way the industry communicates to people can help solve that issue. So question over here, yeah. Didn't Adam Smith give us some answers um, on all of this? Um, he pointed out there's only three things you can tax, land, labour and capital, and only one of them uh, can't run away, get hidden in an offshore bank account, stop breeding or knock off. And um, in that regard, he would be bitterly opposed to a GST. He condemned taxes on the necessities of life because he pointed out that labour was a factor of production. If you tax necessities as consumption, you're not taxing consumption, you're really taxing production and you will get a decline in fertility rates. And I'm not surprised that fertility rates in the Western world have declined as GSTs and VATs have gone up. It just raises the cost of having children, which is exactly why he condemned them. Thank you. I'm not sure if we want to comment on that. Any further questions at all? Or? Sorry, just here. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Paul Feldman, I'm a member of the Council on the Ageing. Um, just wondering, um, with regard to the uh, intended debate about uh, consumer expectations of government involvement, is there any intention to include employer groups in this? Because there seems to be um, a, um, a push to make older people more reliant on providing for themselves. Uh, so, for example, we have the proposal to raise the pension age. Um, people who are older find it very difficult to gain employment um, if they um, happen to be out of a job. And, and given this emphasis on uh, self-reliance, it seems to me that we need to um, include employer groups in that debate about expectation change because um, we need them to perhaps play a leading role in uh, championing the employment of older people. Um, I realise that affirmative action will probably be politically unpalatable to the present government, but, but some, some form of champ championing, particularly by the major employers, such as the supermarkets, in areas where older people are more likely to be able to work successfully, it seems to me, would help. Yeah, I, I can comment on that. I think the, um, the Treasurer alluded to this this morning, and he has personally been a strong supporter of this, and, you know, I was recently a thing where he, he spoke at Bunnings, and, you know, talking... Bunnings are a great employer of older tradies, because they can sort of sit there and give advice rather than, you know, get up on ladders. Um, but it's not, just, uh, it's not just Bunnings that are doing it. There, there's, you know, Telstra are a big supporter of this, McDonald's. I mean, so... And, and certainly, I, I personally heard the Treasurer would be very vocal on this, including this morning. So I think there is a bit of government support behind that. I don't know if anyone else wants to um, comment. Yeah, I, I should comment, firstly, that, uh, that the major... Uh, employer groups have been involved in a number of government-initiated uh, programs, one called Ch Ch Change Champions, um, aimed at mature employment issues, uh, which came out of the uh, roundtable on mature age participation. But in terms of, my, of our proposal around a full-blown retirement incomes review, absolutely, as I said, it should include pensions, super, mature employment issues, uh, um, uh, uh, taxation, aged care funding, uh, and probably... John would toss a couple more in. Um, but uh, yes, they are involved. The roundtables I talked about uh, had uh, the major employer groups present at them uh, and having those conversations. I would also add that we actually need the organised labour movement involved too uh, because the reforms that we experienced in past decades to which the business community is now pointing had the active involvement, particularly the ACTU, in that process. John, did you want to add anything at all? 
Um, yeah, well, Close. we're very active um, with small, um, and I, I often think the answer to this is more with the small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, Bruce Bilson has been very active in that. We're working with um, uh, a gentleman even older than I am who uh, um, is looking at uh, getting older private equity people to go in and help startups. Uh, so it's right across the board. I personally raise the average age at Treasury from 36 to 37 by joining, so I have a great interest in it. I wonder, uh, up, in the, up in the gallery? Yep. Uh, Andrew Podger from ANU. Uh, I was interested in some of the comments made, in particular about the increasing reliance on self-funded retirement into the future, on the problems of managing longevity risk, particularly for individuals who manage long longevity risk, but also the, the point raised by a number of speakers about the wide variations in circumstances, cognitive decline, gender differences, differences amongst people with different education and skills and employment experiences. That mixture makes one wonder that in the deaccumulation phase, whether there needs to be more government intervention that there needs to be more guidance to people as to what they can use their retirement savings for. And the idea of it just being a bit of nudging may not be sufficient if, in fact, the system is so complex and so hard for people to manage. And it may need a level of uh, compulsion uh, or even government involvement in the sale of annuities. I wonder whether particularly Craig and Hazel might be able to answer that. Craig, do you want to kick off? And yeah, sure. Well, I, I, I'm sure Hazel will make the same point. One of the challenges in um, that cohort of the population, which you alluded to, Andrew, is that it's not as homogenous as, say, saving for retirement and accumulation. And so certainly at the financial system inquiry, where we sort of... One, one of the options was for compulsion of some sort of retirement income stream, and we moved away from that because we thought the lack of homogeneity risk compelling people into outcomes that might not be in their best interests. Um, but I think, and, and Hazel might like to talk to this more, I, I think it's a real challenge. At the moment today, we've got an, an, an accumulation or superannuation system where, the, as you would know, Andrew, the majority of Australians are in default system and they're relying on others to, frankly, make the decisions on their behalf. They suddenly approach retirement. Ian will know this better than I, but I know through my own family experience it's a very emotional time, there's very complex decisions, and as Hazel was alluding to before, we haven't really helped or prepared people for those decisions, and they're very complex decisions to make, so I think it's a valid point. Um, I don't think compulsion is necessarily the way to go, though. Okay. So, yes, um, I agree with Craig, a lot of the points Craig's made. Um, so, as Craig said, as people are saving for retirement, you can almost go on automatic pilot. There's a lot of guidance there. So you can be defaulted into a super fund, defaulted into an investment option. But then once you get to retirement, the whole world's out there to make, and it's getting more complex. Um, the FSI did think about a default retirement op um, benefit option. But as we know, and as you alluded to, the problem is that people are so different at retirement, much, much different, more different than they are going into starting the labour force. Um, and there's a real problem with setting default options. Um, default options work because people stick to them. So this is why it's worked in the accumulation. You know, people go on automatic pilot and they stick to them. And it could be the very worst thing to default someone into um, an irreversible product around retirement when they don't really or shouldn't be there. So it, it is a concern. It's hard to know what to do. Um, I do think people need a lot more guidance. People need a lot more help. And we haven't really worked out how to do this. Um, should we rely on the private sector and financial advisors? Should, be there, should there be some government involvement in providing guidance? And is it something that should come from DSS, for example? Um, I think it's something that we really need to, to have, a uh, have a conversation. We won't have a conversation. Discussion. <laughs> we'll have a discussion about. Um, because these things are complicated. Thinking about aged care and aged care support is really complicated. Thinking about what to do, whether, whether I should stay in my house, should I downsize, should I buy a granny flat, should I take a reverse mortgage, should, should I use that as a bond for an aged care place? All of these things are really complicated and to some extent we're going to have to work out how to help people through that process and I don't really think defaults are the answer or um, mandatory policies or defaults are the answer in retirement. John, do you 
Yeah, look, I, I, th I think it's massive, this problem. Um, and I don't think the asset management or the wealth management industry have got their head around it. Um, I think the wealth management industry, I've been encouraging them in the contacts I've had um, to lift their game. And I think uh, they will, because I think they're learning from uh, some of the mistakes in the past. But uh, it's interesting, if you go back to the origins of some of the state trustee companies, which are public sector entities in Victoria or New South Wales, and they were actually, one of their roles 100 years ago was to look after those people who, dementia or whatever, couldn't look after themselves. I don't know what the answer is. There are, I, uh, I think Hazel might have mentioned it, or maybe it was Craig, about encouraging people into retirement into ultra-safe products. Well, you know, with interest rates where they are at the moment, I think that's been broken a compact with a lot of people who diligently save for many years. So there's no real answer. Um, I've always, when people have asked me, encouraged them to go into the old balance products, which have, at least have a decent level of exposure to uh, the equities markets. But it's a massive issue, and uh, I, I shudder at the thought of the government getting more involved in it. But I do think it's an issue that uh, really is one that has to be gone through very, very carefully. And it comes to the young lady at the back from ANU, uh, the role of families and this can be a vex one. There are good people and families who look after people who've got dementia. We just read some of the court cases currently going. There are some less than good people who get involved. And I think it's a sleeping issue, so you're very right to highlight it. Great. Thank you. I think we probably should draw this session to a close now as people need to get to other places. But I think it's been a great morning. Thank you for all your participation and thank you to all the speakers and to CPAR for holding the conference. But I think what it really raises is the question is, with demographic change, we've got some new issues which we need to, to deal with. Government needs to get some new policies. Individuals have to think about how they're going to manage their life in retirement more than they ever have in, in prior years. So it's a big challenge, but I'm sure we're up to it. And thank you, everyone, for participating. And finally... <laughs> and, and a final thank you to all the organisers that put this together and the Treasurer for attending. And uh, thank you. Bye.